some good talks. Yeah. 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 started. Uh, quick intro. My name is Dan Kirkendall. I'm one of the uh, founders and the CTO of NT Objectives. We build a, a web scanning tool. I do some blogging on Man vs. Web App, uh, podcasting there as well, and, and on InfoSec Place. Although we haven't done that many episodes lately. Uh, but much more importantly, I was this year's league winner for our Hackers Only Football, Fantasy Football League. <laughs> After coming in 11th place last year, I was quite happy about this. So I was like smacking down Matt Joe uh, all season, so it was very fun. Um, okay, so what we're going to be covering is a little bit of history on AppSec uh, and kind of around the tools. Uh, we're going to cover our, our Hackazon tool, uh, which is a, a new vulnerable testing app. But um, I think it helps to kind of give a little bit of history as to why it's needed. And uh, so we're going to go through that a little bit as well. So if we, uh, you know, look at some of the perceptions, uh, you know, even Hollywood perceptions have changed. We've kind of moved from being some odd, you know, kids to uh, hunky action stars. So that's cool. We've made progress. Uh, so AppSec research in 99 was pretty, uh, we're, that's really where we were hitting a lot of the fundamentals. Uh, most of this came from RFP, Rainforest Puppy, uh, and some of his, you know, you would call him the father of, of uh, web app security. Those issues in Frack Magazine, if many of you remember this, right, this was back in the day, uh, really kind of started teaching us about the issues with CGI security uh, back then, right, the CGI problems. So. You know, these uh, SQL injection attacks that he kind of documented, uh, those were in 98. And then he had some OS injection in 99. These things were the, the, the starting point. This is where we really started to understand that we could do these kind of injection attacks uh, on web apps. And, you know, prior to that, it was just a bunch of static HTML pages. We weren't really thinking about it this way. So he kind of really set some of that foundation down. Uh, Cross-site scripting arrived in 2000 with the, uh, it was like CERT's second listing that year was the first cross-site scripting attack that had been published. Uh, so, you know, this stuff, this is what we see, this is, they already seen this example basically, or something similar um, from the moment you entered web security. This is from 2000. Nothing's really changed. Um, you know, hacking the apps is, has, was always around kind of looking at the name and value pairs of the parameters, right? So you have your, you know, after the, the, the question mark on the URL, which would be your get parameters, or in the forum posts, you have your name and value pairs. Everything was kind of bit, built around that. Uh, and attacking them has always been very simple. You're really focusing on the value uh, in that pair and then applying attacks. So our, our understanding of it was pretty basic. Coming to today, when we're hunky action stars, 
Um, there's a whole bunch of us hunky action stars here, all right? Uh, there's a lot of great thinkers in this space now. Uh, you know, RFP really kind of started us, but there's been a whole lot of people since. Um, a lot of smart people, there could be much more, many more pictures, but they'd be really small. Um, there's a lot of people really focused on understanding this, and there's a lot of new uh, organizations, right? There's OWASP and WASP, or WASP and WASP, uh, you know, around kind of helping us define this area and understand it. So this is all good stuff. We're making progress. The vuln types have grown from SQL injection, cross-site scripting, and, and OS injection. We've got all kinds of new attack payloads, uh, all, all kinds of new things we're trying to do. Of course, you know, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, command injection, they're all still living with us. They're just now uh, classics, uh, like our music is. Uh, you know, even the web development, we're going to kind of get into that here in a minute, has really changed. The applications are no longer just HTML based, no longer just CGI. We've got very dynamic, complex applications, a lot of AJAX, web services, all kinds of stuff. We're going to get into that. But all of this has really kind of changed our, what's happening in the web app world, uh, but development hasn't changed as much. So going on to the development and the security tools, uh, you know, back in the day, this is the tag cloud basically for, uh, you know, web development. It was very basic, but HTML, some CGI, some get and post. Eventually we started getting like, you know, active server pages, um, PHP, we started getting other stuff kind of coming along, but it was all still very basic. The complexity of these web apps and then the, the DAS tools, the automated scanning tools, there was a bit of a gap, but it wasn't that pronounced. You know, as the, the scanners had to start dealing with the, the frameworks, it kind of moved from being known vuln testing tools, like a standard network scanner, uh, to actual, you know, application scanners that are focused on the app. There was a bit of shift because we're no longer dealing with known vuln checks. We're now dealing with um, having to kind of crawl this unknown thing and then start attacking it and trying to find vulns that, you know, basically finding zero days on its own. So it really kind of changed our game, uh, you know, and kind of, you know, I was in the Foundstone team building the Foundscan product and kind of having to shift the mindset uh, it has been difficult and that was something that took a long time. But they started doing that. So early 2000s, you know, late 99, 2000, uh, that's when the scanner started coming around. So a little history on them, uh, you know, Spy Dynamics, that was the kind of the first one out there. Uh, with WebInspect, uh, and they eventually are now they're part of HP Fortify. That they were in 2000. Um, Convidu, which became Watchfire, which became IBM AppScan. They started in 2000 as well, but they didn't release their first web scanner until 2002. Uh, Sensic was 2001, uh, with their scanner in 2002. And then our company, we, we started in 2002, launched our scanner in 2003. But we were all built back in our, in our infrastructure of the scanner was all built on that old premise, that old ability to kind of crawl the individual pages, look at the uh, request, look at the name and value pairs, and then create attack payloads on those name and value pairs, right? So, you know, building the, 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 the scanners, they're all built on that premise, and that becomes kind of a legacy problem that I'll get into. Um, we ended up kind of re-engineering our scanner uh, a couple years ago, 2014, actually 2013 when it was released. But we had to re-engine our scanner, and I'll get into a little bit of work. Uh, but it kind of sets the tone as to what, what's been changing and how the automated tools need to start catching up a little bit. So we t look at today. In our current web development, we've got all kinds of stuff. I showed this earlier. Where we've got you know all this different traffic. We've got flash remoting with AMF. You've got Google Web Toolkit you know, for some of the AJAX stuff, a lot of JSON these rest interfaces, you got mobile. There's a lot of new technology that web developers are using. So we don't have just the traditional web apps anymore with the HTML. We have all kinds of stuff, right? HTML5 brings us web sockets and local data storage. There's all kinds of new stuff that we have to deal with. Also, the application functionality is different. So we have, you know, the various application workflows, uh, and I'll show that a little bit, uh, you know, anti-CSERF tokens, you've got all kinds of new stuff that you have to deal with 
especially for automated tools for, and for manual pen testing. But you really have a lot of new stuff to have to worry about. You can't just simply crawl in the same way. There's a lot of hurdles. Um, there's a lot of what we call crawl, crawler traps. You know, if you're going to scan an app, you have to be able to navigate all of these things. You have to be able to handle custom 404 messages that you know return a 200 code. You have to be able to deal with all this stuff, uh, and it causes a lot of scanners and problems. And a lot of scanners will tell you, well, you just got to train the scanner, and you got to train the tool. And I think that is a failed option out of the gate because. Whoever's running these scans often don't know the application. You could be in an organization, you've got hundreds, thousands of applications. What's the chances that you know the ins and outs of every one of them? It doesn't exist. You don't have time. You need to spend your time on things that automated tools can't do, right? The privilege escalation and those kind of things. If you want to be focused there, let the automated tools do their job. So I, I really try to push away from this, you know, okay, just train it, right? Let's just do everything in BERT. It's ridiculous. Right, Burp is fantastic for what you for the manual testing, but you need automation to do its job. Um, so there's a lot that we push on there. The complexity of these apps, right, going back to this chart, has now expanded considerably. So as the development models have changed rapidly, the uh, the automated scanner's ability to handle them has not improved as much as it needs to. There's a big gap uh, in what can really, you know, what they can cover. So, you know, this is an area we push on quite a lot, and we try to talk about it quite a lot because you need to understand what scanners can and cannot do, right? And I'm not trying to pitch our product. We, we have kind of closed that gap. We've kind of re-engineered to start closing it. We still haven't closed it all the way, and nobody has, but we're getting better. We're trying to push on these things. Uh, one of the key things that is really breaking scanners is that the format of data has changed. We're no longer just dealing with the name and value pair structure. We have these, you know, custom URL structures, you know, SEO friendly ones. Uh, you've got the, uh, you know, REST interfaces that are using XML, using JSON, got Flash and Flex, Google Web Toolkit. We've got all kinds of formats that the data is in. And if the scanner, which, you know, the scanners are all engineered back in the early 2000s, their whole engine was built around a name and value pair structure. Right, all the tools are, are built that way. Now all of a sudden you're introducing these you know, nested data structures that are more complex and the scanner's internal engines aren't up to the task. They, they're really built around the name and value pair. They don't understand how to deal with this. Um, even the WAFs, you know, going on the defensive side, WAFs don't handle this stuff, right? The easiest way to attack somebody that's got a WAF is find their REST interfaces because the WAF is doing nothing. They're useless. Um, so, you know, scanners <coughs> generally handle traditional web apps, uh, mobile-friendly web apps, which are still HTML-based, that you know, to look good on a phone. They can handle some of the rich internet apps, but as, those in, as they're hitting their REST interfaces, they really start to fall off. Uh, so, these are kind of areas where we've got to understand this as a community and be able to deal with it. You know, some of it's going to be manual testing, some of it's going to be finding tools that can handle this stuff, or pushing vendors to support them. Uh, and, and then mobile apps. You know, everybody's really generally focused on the mobile device and the app sitting on there. But to me, those REST interfaces that that, web, that mobile app is communicating with, much more interesting. So this traditional model doesn't work out. What we had to do was kind of extend this model uh, with what we call a universal translator. I think everybody's gonna be moving down this path because what we basically do is say, okay, we still do the crawling, but it needs to feed into an engine that has the ability to parse all of these different formats, understand each of these different formats, kind of come into a common structure, also take in recorded data, so I can take in traffic from a mobile app or some, uh, you know, the, web, the, the REST interface, they've got some client to it. If I can record that traffic, feed it into the scanner, it'll identify the format, and then be able to go off and start attacking those interfaces. So you really need to kind of expand the thinking on these engines. We've already done this in our tool. I think everybody's going to eventually start doing it. But it really requires kind of a, a you know, paradigm shift in how the scanner is built and, and how it understands the traffic of you know, apps today. So you know, I, I mentioned earlier that depending on training is a failed option. right? But now all of a sudden I'm saying, OK, let's train it with reported traffic. The problem is. 
uh, especially with REST interfaces, they, a lot of people don't have these REST interfaces documented in a useful form. They have Word docs, uh, and there was a talk yesterday about this uh, that kind of went into more detail, so I'm not going to cover it thoroughly, but a lot of people have these REST interfaces, and they'll have like a Word doc that describes how to use it. Okay, great, that's good for me to get another developer, but it's not any in use for an automated testing tool. There are things that can help. So there's WSGL 2.0 uh, was extended to support being able to describe a REST interface. WSGL is generally for SOAP, uh, but you can actually describe a REST interface. Now, of course, it's WSGL, so it's ugly as hell and a mess to deal with, uh, but it's there. Uh, Waddle was actually created for REST interfaces. So that's there. It's an XML format, kind of similar to, to WSGL, uh, but it, it's really def just set up to just define REST interfaces. Uh, it's got very little adoption. I think it's basically going to die uh, because nobody's using it. So what's come along is Swagger, uh, and our little Swagger guy down here. Uh, it's JSON based. It looks like a JSON string that describes the REST interface. It's got a lot of very useful stuff going on, a very active community that's developing it. Um, you can describe your REST interface actually in code, and it'll generate the little JSON. Uh, and then that actually can be used to generate documentation, you know, like printable documentation. Uh, and it can actually generate uh, clients right off of the code base. So you can, you know, there's different, whatever programming language you're going to build your stuff in, you can actually auto-generate the basic client. So it's very powerful. I like Swagger a lot. Uh, and tools need to, you know, automated testing tools need to be able to take in you know, WSDL, Waddle, Swagger documents to be able to then auto-generate those requests against the backends. Um, so anyway, I think, you know, this is the area where training is still required, but we want to move away from that. We need more and more automation. Uh, and also make sure, as you're kind of going through and testing different tools, uh, that, you know, I've seen plenty of scanners say they support JSON. Uh, but again, remember, most of the scanners were built a long time ago, built around the name and value pairs, and they've tried to kind of convert their existing code and kind of wedge it over. Uh, and so what I've seen a few of them do is say, okay, we support JSON, and, and if you send it like a very simple JSON string, um, they'll kind of convert it internally to name and value pairs, and then be able to attack it. The problem is that only works in very basic situations. Most of the time, JSON, when you're using it, is because you have complex data to set. And so if you've got this you know, nested data structure, they just fall apart. So they're not going to scan anything. So you want to kind of make sure that your tools kind of handle this stuff. Um, be either, you know automated or manual, you want to make sure that you can actually get in and attack the individual parameters. Um, so this is where it gets interesting. Okay, so this is really where the, the, the heart of what this whole talk about is with Hack is on, is around the vulnerable test apps. There's been a lot of vulnerable test apps over the years. Uh, really kind of started off and uh, Jeff Williams in the room next door uh, created WebGo. Right, this is back in 2002. Pretty much, how many people have used WebGo? Like everybody, right? Um, it's old, it's kind of lame, but it still does what you kind of want it to do as far as learning the basics, right? It's very good for learning how to do web security and having a test platform. Um, it's not very good for automated, for kind of like comparing automated tools because it's a very static thing. It's not very realistic as far as like a real app. Uh, and it's too easy to kind of create known vuln checking against WebGo and find 100%, surprisingly, which would never happen. Um, so it's, it's not good for that, but it's what we have, and that's what's been around for a very long time. It's a, it's a good tool for what it is. Uh, jumping forward to today, um, we have so many <laughs> vulnerable test apps that we need lists. Um, like the, the, the VWAD uh, for that OWASP is hosting. Uh, there's a lot of vulnerable test apps for a lot of different purposes. Uh, you know, and like it says here, you know, this is how standards expand, right? You know, it's like somebody complains like, oh, why is there so many? We need a unified, and then we create a new standard. So uh, we see this sort of thing a lot. Um, however, there's reasons, and it's okay. There's, so the, the, the VWAD actually has uh, two lists. There's like the offline list, the stuff you can download and install yourself, um, and there's a lot of good apps there. And then there's the off the. Oh, one of these online. Oh, 
Yeah, there's VMs. That's when they both of them are off. Okay, these are actually the whatever. There's a, you can go look at the list, but uh, there's online lists. There's an offline list. There's some virtual machines that you can get as ISO. There's a whole bunch of different ones. They're great, uh, and they all generally have some very good things to, that you can do with them. You can go in and really learn about dealing with web security. So a few notables, of course, WebGoat's still there, and they are updating it finally. Um, Although they keep saying it's going to come out, and it's been a long, long time it hasn't come out. But um, WebGoat is eventually going to be up updated, uh, but it's still there, and it's now part of OWASP. Um, there's the Hack Me Bank, books, casino, shipping, traveling, um, all the Foundstone stuff. You know, shortly after I left, and I kept begging them to do web security, and they weren't interested. Uh, after we got into web security, they realized it was kind of cool. So. Um, they started doing stuff. Those are actually very good tools. They have some very fun things that you can do. Um, and again, they look like real apps, which is what I kind of like over something like WebGoat, which is really a training environment. Um, and then there's the damn vulnerable web app, which is very good, does some cool stuff. I think it's much more popular than it ought to be just because it has a cool darn name. So everybody likes the DBWA. Um, but it's, it's good. And it's actually fairly good for kind of testing tools as well, testing scanners. But it's, it's a good little, good little set there. Um, there's some that are actually designed for testing automated tools. So there's the wave set. There's wave set, which uh, was created for um, a report that Shea Chen was doing to kind of compare automated scanners and you know, both open source and commercial. And so it was designed to kind of test um, what vulnerabilities these scanners could find. And there was some you know, HTML droplets and JavaScript stuff that you had to kind of navigate through. That was fairly cool, uh, but it's still limited and I'll get into a little bit of why. Um, and then there's Wibbit, which doesn't really have vulnerabilities. It just tests a crawler's ability to get to places. Okay, so it's got all these, you know, that's really what's like, you know, does it handle JavaScript doing this? Does it have JavaScript doing that? Um, you know, does, all these different crawler problems. It kind of tests if you, can, if, you can get, if you can get through it and get to the destination. Um, one problem with this is it's really easy to cheat, because as long as you just know the list of URLs that, are, that you're going to eventually land on, and you just make a request there, it counts. <laughs> um, so Wibbit's kind of useful, but, uh, and I actually uh, modified the code, and submitted the changes uh, to the repository, so it actually kind of randomizes the destination pages. But those tools are kind of good for their individual little things that they do. The problem is that all of these scanners, I mean all of these, web, these vulnerable web apps, have really kind of stayed with classic web 1.0 uh, technologies. They're still just generally basic HTML, maybe some bit of JavaScript, um, but they're just sending traditional gets and posts, you know, got links and, and forms. Uh, they really have not modernized the look and feel and the, and the activity that's going on in the application. Um, so as we want to move forward, and what I was looking for is something that kind of lets us see what today's apps look like. When I'm doing assessments, when I'm doing, you know, work with our customers, the applications are much different. They are very dynamic, very rich, all the Ajax, they got mobile components. So here comes Hackazon. I finally decided we need a tool as a community, a, a vulnerable app that reflects what today's apps look like. So Hackazon is a fake app test site type of site, so it's kind of like Hackme Bank and Casino. It looks like a real site, although uh, Hackme Casino is the tackiest thing in the world, so I don't think it would be a real casino like that. But it at least tries to look like a casino site, or you know, there's the banking site. Um, so we try to replicate that style, where it's a, a fake app. Um, it is an online storefront, that's why it's called Hackazon. Um, and it includes a mobile app, it's a little companion app, um, that uses the REST interfaces of Hackazon um, to you know, do its work, and I'll show all this stuff. But it's a, it's a, you know, it's a modern looking app, we're going to actually look at it here in a minute. Uh, it's generally pretty easy to install and configure. There's a little wizard that kind of gets you through the install. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'll list this stuff here later, but it's a basic, you know, LAMP type of application. It's 
pretty straightforward to, to get. It's all open source. We're going to be donating the copyrights to OWASP once the dust settles on the code. Uh, but we're actively developing it. We've got a few people working on it, and we're having a lot of fun kind of building it out and just kind of getting it so, to be something that not only can you test automated scanners against, but really um, you can use in for the training, like WebGo. You can actually stick people on it. One of the very cool things, it's got you know the AJAX activity, it's got the HTML, it's got the AJAX interfaces that the the REST interfaces that AJAX uses, that mobile uses. There's some there's a lot of different technologies. There's like some Google Web Toolkit here, some JSON over here. There's uh, flash components for like banner ads. And there's a flash component that uses AMF uh, for like entering the coupon code. Um, there's actually some strict workflows. There's a lot of different stuff going on here that, again, stuff that reflects real applications. Um, and the other very cool thing, and we'll get to this, is that the vulnerabilities are configurable. So you can actually go into the admin screens and decide which vulnerabilities this install is going to be vulnerable to. So you know, if you're doing this in a classroom environment, you can have you know, all 10 systems set up with different vulns and say, go find it, you know, go find what's there, and, and you put people to different tasks. And if you're testing automated tools, again, you can see if they try to cheat. You go, hey, attack is on, here's the vulns. Um, you know, like people do with, with WebGo. So it really kind of becomes fun in that way that you can kind of adjust this thing to your needs. Also, if you're not, let's say you're not doing any Google Web Toolkit stuff, then you can turn off all the volumes that are available through the Google Web Toolkit sections so that it doesn't, you know, you don't find volumes that you don't care about, basically, and that aren't uh, applicable to your environment and who you're trying to teach. Uh, so workflows. Uh, just so you understand what this is, uh, we see workflows all the time, and this is a very simple one. It's a storefront, so an application workflow in this case is the shopping cart. Okay, the uh, the process of going through and saying, okay, I need to go through this sequence of events to do a checkout. Right, add an item to the cart, view the cart, checkout button that's going to ask me for my shipping info, my billing info. I'm going to eventually confirm my order and I get a receipt. Right? That's kind of a standard process we've all been through a bazillion times. Uh, one of the problems here, especially with automated tools and the manual process, is that uh, a lot of automated tools will allow you to train them to this workflow, but they're really just learning that for the discovery and crawling process. Um, but if you think about it, you know, if I go through this entire workflow, after I've submitted my order and I get my receipt, my session is reset. I have nothing in my cart again. I can't start attacking later on. I can't go and start attacking step four in this sequence. If I haven't set it up, it's going to reject me. It's going to say, hey, you know, why are you attacking the shipping page? You don't have anything in your cart. Right? Well, it doesn't think you're attacking, but why are you here? Go away. Right? And this is something you're going to see in a lot of apps that you're dealing with. You really have to be able to respect the workflow. You have to set it up. You have to go through and add an item to your cart, view your cart, check out, Shipping info, then you might attack, you know, you might attack the shipping info as step four, but you'd have to set all these things up. And you need to either know that you as the human tester have to do this, or your automated tools need to be able to handle this process. Most scanners can't do this. Uh, so you need to kind of go through, and sometimes you even have to follow through further. Because let's say I go through and I set it up, I do an attack, and maybe the payload actually is going to work. But let's say the data, let's say I, I attack one of the, the last name field here in the shipping info. It might be stored in session state at that point. It's not going to be committed to a database, a SQL database, until you actually confirm your order. So it's not until you get to the end that you might see the error show up. Right? So you have to follow this through. And you have to be able to kind of set it up, do the attack, and follow through. And then either the human pen tester has to do this, which is miserable, or your automated tools have to be able to handle these kind of workflow situations. This is very common stuff. And this is kind of the things we wanted to do with, with Hackathon is, uh, and I'll get into the, uh, I'm going to go to the actual using of it here in a second. We wanted to kind of replicate a lot of this functionality that is very realistic. So that as you're going through and, and cutting your teeth on these things, that you can actually get in and deal with it. So, uh, so here's Hackathon. Let me actually throw yeah. 
right, so you know, basic stuff. It's a standard you know, get request. It's kind of somewhat clear. It's given an HTML based response, no big deal. Um, there is this AMF traffic. It's a uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with AMF. It's the uh, action script messaging format, so it's what Flash uses to communicate with its backends. Uh, and so it looks like binary data when you're looking at it, uh, but it can be decoded, and, and Burp actually has a decoder built in. Um, and so you can see that it's requesting something here, and it's getting back, and it's going to get back a, a binary response, but again, decodable. So it's getting a, an image for this uh, banner, oops, for this banner down here. Yeah, so this little thing here has got a few images that it can cycle through, right? Um, this time it actually got four. So it was asking for four, and it got four different pictures of that. Uh, but this is, you know, this is stuff you can actually play with and attack. I might uh, take this request and send it to... Oops, uh, I go to repeater, here's the request, right? It's four, uh, and I send it, I'm going to get back four different pictures is what I'm seeing here, right? Um, I can change this to, let's say, two. <coughs> Send my request, and I should get two pictures back. Uh, I could potentially toss in a little SQL injection single quote here, right? A little single quote, you can see it. A little single quote in front of the two. these things. Uh, you know, if I do, as I say here on my, on my front page, I'm going to add something to my cart. I'm going to click on the little button. Uh, the page isn't reloading, but you can see that it's showing <laughs> items in my cart. Uh, that's, you know, some simple request here is actually a, it's a REST request, but it's passing name and value pair structures, but it's getting back JSON. This JSON is actually what's used to render this thing up here on the on top. Right, so this is the kind of stuff you're going to see in, in real apps. And you have to be able to really start getting in there and attacking. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff. We've got uh, the Contact Us page. It's got some uh, Google Web Toolkit here so I can... Actually, no, this is a JSON. So I can submit something here. And uh, so thank you for, for your question. And uh, that was actually sending data equals and a JSON string, right? So you, as a tester or your tools, have to be able to handle these nested data structures, right? Which get add more complexity. And I see I see some crazy ones. I'll see ones like this, where it's data equals a JSON string, and then within the JSON string, one of the values is like an XML node or a common delimited node. It's like, what the hell did you just? you know, keep it all in one. But you see these things, and again, either you, the tester, or, uh, you know, or your, your tools need to be able to cope with this. Right? If I wanted to take an attack of this, again, I can send it to repeater, and I might come in here and, uh, I don't know, let me see the contact name is vulnerable. I'll put just a single quote here in the contact name and send it. And I'm getting an error. Yeah, here we go. Database error. All right. Now, you have to be able to handle the fact that you're dealing with these nested data structures. I'm having to put my attack payload within the value of this JSON string. Right. This is the kind of stuff that we're seeing with new apps that a lot of people are ignoring. You're kind of looking at this whole JSON string and I'm not going to mess with that. But you got to get in there and actually do it. And your tools have to be able to do it. You know, we've updated our scanner to be able to support these type of environments. But, you know, going, if I'm in here in Burp, it's not handling it for me. If I see my parameters, it's just showing me, you know, in the body field is this, this thing. I, it's not separating it down for me. It's not giving me these individual parameters of attack. I have to go in there and do it myself. So it's a real pain. A lot of people aren't doing it. But these are the kind of things we want to replicate for everybody in Hackathon, is to be able to set up 
all of these different things. We've got a Google Web Toolkit in places. Um, you guys familiar with how that looks? It's like a pipe delimited format. Uh, and so you, it's like, you know, it, it doesn't have a name and value. It's just value pipe, value pipe, value pipe. And on the back end, it has a, a it's, it's positionally sensitive. And on the back end, it has like a, uh, a data structure defined there. So that's a real pain. Uh, there's all these different formats that we're dealing with. Now let's look at mobile for a second. All right? So here's our little companion mobile app. This is an Android app. Uh, so you know, I come in here. It's got the same products. I can come in here, look at the products, see the details, add it to my cart. Uh, I can go to my cart, see what's in there, go through the whole checkout process. Uh, actually, this should all be running full burst. Let's take a look here for a second. Uh-oh, I didn't set the two bird. All uh, right, give me a sec. It's my action list. All right, let me set this up. You guys familiar with how to set for your proxy in Android? Uh, 
but you have all these different formats of the data coming in, and eventually it's just getting, it's clearing the cart uh, on the app. And you got a successful order, right? I can actually go and look at my history of all my orders. Here's all the different orders I've placed. And here's the one right now. You order that little Martha Stewart thing, right? Uh, but these, all these requests are being done. This is getting my list of orders, right? And this is a, a simple name and value pair structure. Again, we see a lot of mixing and matching in today's apps. There's some, you know, name and value pairs as gets, some on posts. You're gonna, you might send JSON. You might receive JSON back. You might, you know, send JSON and get XML back. You're seeing a lot of mixing and matching. So again, this is kind of thing we added here. But here's my list of order, my uh, list of orders, and it's giving me a JSON packet back with all of the, the orders that I've placed. Um, then I go and drill into one individual order, and of course this is now a different API structure, right? API order 11, uh, and then it's going to send me that data in, in JSON here. So we're seeing a lot of this different stuff, and Hackazon allows you to kind of go and actually play with this type of environment, or this type of environment. A lot of times, you know, if you want to test this stuff up until now, you've had to kind of test your own apps, and they may not be vulnerable. <coughs> They might not be the best place and people might not like you doing that. Uh, so the, the final thing I want to make sure we cover is the admin interface. Now this is an online storefront, it's a content manager. So it has a lot of the, the stuff you would generally expect. You can actually come in here and manage your, your product categories and your products. Uh, and this is actually attackable as well. <laughs> uh, but you can come and play with the admin interface. But down here, that's something that most online storefronts wouldn't have which is the ability to look at uh, your vulnerability config right? and actually see what's going to be vulnerable here. So actually, let me look at the matrix first. So this is the list of different vulnerabilities that are kind of available and you can see which ones are enabled or not. Uh, you can actually decide which ones, like you might say it's vulnerable to cross-site scripting uh, as reflected but or persistent, right? And so maybe somebody can add, add something to the uh, you know, like a product review, and that's going to end up being persistent with the product. Uh, or you just might say just reflected. But you can actually pick and choose, which is kind of fun. Uh, but you have all these different vulnerabilities to kind of play with, and we're adding more. Um, and so I can come in and say, okay, let's go look at the actual config, uh, put it into edit mode. And I'll look at the, uh, let's see, the account screen here. But it's actually like a little building blocks. So you can actually come in and decide which fields are going to be vulnerable on a page. And then within that field, you know, is it is it through JSON or is it, you know, standard get post? There's a whole bunch of different choices on where this is actually going to be vulnerable. It gets a little complicated. We put some docs together for it. But you can actually come in here and individually decide, right, on the orders page, uh, you know, so my, my orders, uh, the page is vulnerable, and these are both uh, the ID actually ID parameters vulnerable to cross site scripting. So I'll do it that, I'll do store, right? And I'll now once I save this, it's actually going to become vulnerable, right? So you can kind of come in here and play with this sort of thing, and it gets to be kind of fun again, especially as you're setting this up for for other people and setting up the environment to either teach people or to test your tools. It's a pretty cool way to do this. So. Um, I guess that's it. I mean, that's really what I want to cover. We're done a little bit early, but uh, leave some room for questions. Uh, but it's pretty simple as far as getting set up. Like I said, it's a LAMP stack. That's why I've been running here on my Windows machine. Uh, all right, any questions? Go ahead, Caleb. Hey, Dan. Sorry if I missed it, but how long did it take you to put that whole thing together? It looks like a lot of work. <laughs> it was a lot of work. Um, I had been like dreaming of it <laughs> for uh, since uh, I guess the end of 2013 and 2014 started kind of setting up plans to do it. We started it in the summer and we basically built it over the last six months. I actually had a, a high school intern start and he was the guy who started it with me and um, and then I quickly saw it was going to be well beyond him. So uh, I had to hire a couple guys and, and just putting people to work on it. But yes, yeah, uh, eight months, something like that. Uh, 
Uh, with regards to the code base, because you mentioned that the vulnerabilities can be disabled and like, configured, what have you. Um, so the code paths where the vulnerabilities are exposed versus disabled, um, is that also revealed in code as well? Like, right, how easy yeah. is it to discern the vulnerable versus not vulnerable things? Because I myself as a trainer would love to be able to use that as... So, it's, it's probably not good, like, if you're doing like static analysis, it might be a little confusing. Because in the code, it actually um, it references like a config for like which filter to apply. Yeah. Uh, and I guess that's somewhat real, but it's a little different. We, we like and that's kind of why we picked the the framework that we did. I think PHP Pixie is the framework because it was kind of easy to kind of twist and make it vulnerable where we wanted to. Uh, but uh, yes, in code you can actually see, and we have all the places where we expose it to vulnerabilities. And um, so it's basically, you know, we're doing the input handling. Uh, and, and then we refer to the config. And it's actually a config file. So like when you save the config, if you set it so that Hackzon can write to the config directory, which I wouldn't suggest, um, it will go ahead and do that. But otherwise, it will actually give you the files to save. You know, kind of like a lot of content managers like WordPress are using the WP config to, to save to your file system. So it'll do that. But it, it is configurable in code. You can kind of see where it's happening uh, and where we kind of ex expose things. So like not every input can be vulnerable because we haven't set up every input to be vulnerable. Yeah, it's just like my like the use case that I can see for, for this for like training developers um, for like a security mindset mm -hmm. would be to be able to point at where like where the vulnerabilities happen in code and if it, if the fix or correct code is also right there. Like, uh, and they compare their solution to the correct, like the correct path. That, that was what you I should thinking. be able to. Yeah. I think it would work that way. I'm trying to, I'm like the code, and I mean, it's all kind of sitting there. It's you know, not exactly like a switch statement, but kind of. Right. <laughs> right. It's, it's it's kind of similar to that type of solution. Okay. I teach an ethical hacking course, and um, I'm just sitting here thinking if I if I let 40 students, you know. Unleash on this thing in a lab environment. How easy is it? How, how easy is it to refer back to a default config? Like, really yeah, you just go hack is on slash install and kind of run through like three steps and it's oh really resets the database. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, I we had to because you know I, got, I, have, I have a hosted copy here, right? There's one we're hosting on hackazon.webscantest.com. And that one just gets trashed all the time. <laughs> so I have a cron job that keeps resetting. Oh, really? Right. <laughs> because it's terrible. How vulnerable is the back end? Uh, we haven't done as much testing on the admin interface. Uh -huh. We haven't done as much there because, you know, we usually block that with like an HT access file and, and it's got a separate password and everything. So uh, I haven't done as much on that yet. But I imagine it probably is. We haven't, I mean, <laughs> you know. I got a few different people working on, on the code, not just me. And, and sometimes I look at their stuff and it's not, this isn't vulnerable places it shouldn't be. <laughs> That's part of the fun, I guess. Um, on a similar note, um, so I've been to the PCI lab you know, numerous times for you know, testing out products and ensure that they're you know, PCI certified and all that fun stuff. Um, but talking about the mess that scanners make in, you know, in tools like this, I'm wondering if, like, if you have the ability to delete all that data, is that is that a realistic setup for a tool? Because in reality, like you know, applications like this in the, in the real world are gonna have crap all over them. You know, yeah. user created content, all these sorts of things. So I'm just wondering, if, like, is is that something stuff like this should be doing? Should they be deleting content? That's a fair question. Um, you know, we run into this with our customers all the time, right? We, people will take our scanner and, and point it to an app. And you know, I've had instances where people have launched a scan, and you know, I'm sitting there talking with them while it's kind of getting started, and, and a couple minutes into you know, our chit chat while it's running, all of a sudden, you know, at one time this guy's office like just exploded with noise, and I'm like, what's going on? And everybody was yelling and screaming, and and uh, basically it was like a contact us page, and the the scanner was attacking that page, and it, which generated like 3,000 emails to the sales team, and you know. Two minutes, right over, right, and so they're all screaming because their blackberries are like exploding, and uh, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, well, we gotta have some companies compensating controls. I mean, a kid with a Perl script could do the same thing effectively, right? So, 
if the scanner can do something destructive that, you know, without any intending to do anything malicious, so could somebody with a Perl script that is intending to be malicious. So uh, I usually try to, you know, counsel them a little bit, kind of get them off the ledge, and then kind of say, look, we need to put some limiters in there. Uh, but going to your main point, it is absolutely true. I mean, we see this with people scanning forums, and then the forums got tons of crap data. Uh, and it's very difficult for them to clean it up because it might be spread across you know, a dozen different tables or something. So kind of cleaning up the mess is difficult. Um, but it's much worse for them. I couldn't, I, I guess I can't think of a way to kind of make that cleanly replicated in Hackazon other than just not, you know, like, what would you do to clean it other than the install, you know, slash install? <laughs> but, go ahead, Chris, you have a question? Yeah, so, so do you have any plans to uh, add other types of uh, technology in there? So, for example, um, we see a lot more JavaScript heavy single page ads coming along, mm -hmm. and then there's lots of, lot of use of OAuth. Do you plan on doing that, or are you, are you planning on just handing over to OAuth and having the OAuth community and all that? We're definitely going to be adding OAuth for the mobile app. Uh, one of the difficulties is I wanted to make it really easy for someone just to grab and go. And if there's OAuth involved, now you got to set up, you know, the providers and the whole, you know, key exchange and all that business. Uh, so I wanted to kind of keep that simple. But we're we're going to have an OAuth option in there, and then allow the user to configure things in the mobile app. Uh, so that is coming. Um, other technologies, there is a lot of Ajax stuff. I didn't really kind of scroll through it, but it, it is kind of like, where you, it's like one of those infinite scrolling pages where you keep scrolling down and it keeps populating more items. It has a lot of that type of stuff, uh, and we're going to continue to add to that. But um, I am kind of getting curious, you know, we're probably going to stop, like, as much active development, you know, with three people basically full-time on it, and kind of start seeing who wants to contribute. Uh, and I've got some people, like Greg Foss, uh, he was looking at doing some stuff with it. He's been kind of playing. So, you know, I think other people will start adding, hopefully. You know, and it'll kind of continue living. Any other questions? Do you have any database there? There is, yes. There's a couple. There's a couple in there. Uh, yeah, there's a couple DOM base. There's like the, the Flash applet is also vulnerable. Uh, it's where you like enter your coupon code. And um, you can get the discount and then, you know, basically change your, your discount and get 99% 90, off and that sort of thing. So <laughs> you can have fun with some of those things. But yeah, there's DOM based cross site scripting. Um, there's um, some C surf stuff that we've added and, and some broken C surf models. So there's a couple of different little things in there. But yeah, we want to keep adding. I'm trying to, I'm looking at like that list that I showed earlier with a cloud of all the different, you know, like let's say the WASC list. I want to replicate, I want, I would like every one of them to have an example within Hackathon. It'll take a while, <laughs> but that's kind of the goal. I may have missed this, I apologize if I did, but does Hackathon have any of the, um, you know, the traps? Like, you know, you said it great, if you, you can't scan what you can't, you can't scan what you can't crawl or something like that. Mm -hmm. Does Hackathon have any of those traps in there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's kind of yeah, and, and some of them are, you know, you've got to get through, uh, like, a couple Google Web Toolkit ones where if you don't post properly, then you don't get to the next page. And, yeah, there's some, some traps. There's some of the things that we saw in uh, uh, WaveSet, or not WIVIT. There's some of the things in WIVIT we've kind of replicated or copied over. So we're, we're putting more of that stuff in there. It's not totally crazy, though, so most scanners can get through most of it. They just won't be able to attack very much because they won't understand the nested data structures or the JSON or whatever. All right, anybody else? I think we're about out of time. All right, well then, thank you very much.